let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Biblically speaking, men are called to be spiritual leaders. But when we look at society in light of scriptural truth, we find that women tend to be the spiritual foundation. And as they live in obedience to God's commands, His words, His instructions, we find that that propels society. It also has a great influence on men in being faithful to their role. But when women turn away from what God has instructed them to do and be, then we see society plummets. And this is true historically. And the primary message of the text that we're going to be looking at this evening has to do with the Hebrew word senua, which is modesty. We have seen in the past historically, sociologists have proven this, that when modesty in a society is done away with by women, that society enters into a decline politically, economically, socially, in almost every aspect of that society. When we look at today's passage and something that I'm going to be saying over and over, not just tonight, but throughout our study of the book of Isaiah, especially the first several chapters of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is that God is not pleased with his people. I've shared with you, we've taught this in our study center in Israel, and there as well. Hashem lo merutzei im amo. God is not pleased with his people. And I want to proclaim very loudly that women are foundational in the spiritual well-being of society. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 3. We began that chapter last week. We're going to conclude it, God willing, this week. And in regard to this issue of modesty, I mean, think for a moment. If there is an important event Men come in suits or sometimes in tuxedos, and more or less we all look the same. But, but women, their attire, jewelry, makeup, and such, oftentimes is for one purpose, and that is to attract attention to their physical features. But biblically, there's an emphasis upon modesty, and those type of characteristics that are within, not external. This is the emphasis on the spiritual dimension, and this is so important for females. Well, you'll see why I've shared the things that I have shared with you at the beginning of this study when we turn and look at the passage. Now, once more, we see that the major theme early on in the book of Isaiah, is judgment. Why? Once more, because God is not pleased with his people. Notice what it says here, Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, The Lord, he stood to contend. Now, there's a couple important words that we need to deal with. That first one is for God standing. If you know Hebrew, you might think that this is a word, la'amod, to stand. But it's a word which means to be positioned in a location. And this Hebrew root has a degree of stability. So God takes a stand. He's stable. And the purpose is to bring stability into society. And therefore, God is doing something. Some English Bibles will say he pleads, but it's the word la rev. Rev, if you hear that in modern Hebrew, it's a word of contention. 
God has a contention with and he's behaving in light of those things that that he stands in contradiction to. So once more, God is not pleased with the behavior of his people. Once more, verse 13, it's the name yud heh vav the Lord. The Lord, he, he stood in contention. This is what it's saying against his people. Now it says, ve amod, this is the word to stand in a regular sense. He stands for judgment or to judge. And this is a word for evaluation, which leads to condemnation. Once more, judgment, punishment is coming. And it's for the amin, the peoples. Now, sometimes the word am can speak of a people in a very generic sense. And when it's plural, I mean peoples, it's talking about nations and such. But here, this is one of the occasions where the term I mean is probably, and oftentimes, the rabbinical view and where this is applicable, I disagree with. But here, I do not. Where it's talking about Amin, it's probably speaking about the Shnaim Asar Shevetim, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the reason why I say this is if we look on to the next verse, verse 14, we find the same term for God, the Lord, yud heh In judgment, he comes with the elders, and here it is, elders of his people. And here, there's no question that this prophecy that we're dealing with from Isaiah is geared to Israel. We've seen this. If you go back to chapter 3, we find that the koteret, that is the the headline or the main message that, that I have written by the editors of this Bible, is that, Mishpat Hashem al Yehuda the judgment of the Lord upon Judah and Jerusalem. So the ones who have edited this, they have put together this Hebrew Bible. They see this chapter as as well relating to Judah and more specifically the city of Jerusalem. And that God's judging it. And this is what we see in verse 14. The Lord, he will come in judgment. But notice it begins with the elders of his people. And then the next word, sarav, this is the high official. The word sar today speaks about one who is a a cabinet member of a government. So it's a higher position. So here he's speaking about the elders and those who have a leading role, a major position in the government. And he says that you've done something. He says, you, you have exploited your position. You have used it to do what? And you have, and it's a word for burned up, but here it's probably a reference for consuming. That you have consumed the vineyard. And vineyard, we're going to see, we're in chapter 3, but when we get to chapter 5, we're going to see that Israel, collectively, as a people, as a nation, is called a vineyard. And what the leadership has done has exploited, consumed the people, the nation, for the leadership's own benefit, their own financial gain, not in utilizing their position to bring blessing upon the entire nation and the people collectively, but they have exploited them. And it says, Gezilat he'ani, the, the thievery of the poor. So they have taken by force from the poor and what they have taken, that, that theft, is where it says at the end of verse 14, in their homes. So they have made it very personal. 
They have exploited the poor, utilizing their position in order to bring that theft of the poor into their homes for their own personal enjoyment. Now, this improper leadership, we're going to see that it has an outcome. But now he wants to define this improper leadership in very vivid terms. He says, for what have you crushed my people and the faces of the poor ones you have grounded up? So it's two vivid terms for grinding, meaning just, just to make ruin of, and also crushing, very harsh terms, very much terms of violent exploitation of the people and of the poor. And then notice how God reveals himself. Neum Adonai Elohim Sevaot, the Lord God of hosts. Now, the term when we have the Lord or the Lord God of hosts, it is a term that relates to God being powerful, that he is, and it's a word here, first, the word for master, one who has authority. And then the normal term for Lord, that sacred name, yud heh vav in relationship to the hosts. So it's the term that, that, that exudes power, authority, and the ability to carry out judgment. Now he's going to show some very clear terms of, of this improper leadership. How has it manifested itself in the society and the behavior of society? Look now to verse 16. Verse 16 to the end of this chapter shows how it has manifested itself in immorality. Verse 16. And the Lord said, because Benot Zion, the daughters of Zion. Now, Zion, as I've shared and I will continue to do so, Zion has to do with a kingdom des designation. So these young women who are marked for the kingdom, they're not behaving like the daughters of the kingdom. Rather, we're going to see here that they, they walk how? It says that they have a haughty. Now, this is a word in its original form which means to elevate oneself. So this haughtiness is rooted in pride in believing that they are superior. Rather than modesty, humility, that which, which expresses a godly character, a godly faith, no, they are exalting self. And they walk with their necks. Now, it's literally the word garon, throat, but it's in reference here to, to uh, necks, their necks outstretched. So it is a posture of pride. That's what the scholars teach us. And then keep reading it, it says, and they have eyes that are, are wanton, meaning they look all around. And the implication is they're seeking, they're searching, they're looking for that which is not proper, that which fulfills their desires for self-exaltation, and self-exaltation is always, always, always for self-gratification. I want to exalt myself so I can find personal pleasure. Self-exaltation for self-gratification. It always goes this way. And then look at the end of verse 16. It says that, that the walk of these women, ve tafof. What's that? Well, it's, it's related to kind of a choppy walk. It is a unique, not a normal walk, but it's a walk with a purpose. And what is that? Well, if we keep reading, it's that their walk with their feet does something. Te akasna. That word is going to repeat later on, and it's a word that, that is rooted in ankle bracelets and these ankle bracelets 
their primary purpose based upon the the etymology of the word is not a a beauty or to call attention to their their splendor like jewelry but they have a different purpose they jingle they make noise so it's not the purpose of jewelry for the sake of saying wow this jewelry brings the person's eyes and then sees the person no this is not jewelry so much as to capture one's one's uh, eyes initially but their ears it's to draw attention and then having done so it will will cause ones to look upon them verse 17 the lord now this is adonai not yudhe vavhe but the word adon and it's speaking here about the master god his ability his sovereignty it says and the lord will strike now, some would say strike uh, with, with scabs or boils or some type of, of uh, uh, plague. But it's really not clear in the original language. But he's going to strike the top of the head of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will expose. This is a word for nakedness. And the best way to understand this is their their private uh, areas of their body so it's like you want to be in modest i'll show your immodesty it is a word that leads to the outcome of shame so what god is saying is this immodesty produces shame and this is an important principle and when we look at most societies today we see that it's a society of immodesty and that immodesty will in fact put shame upon upon people god's going to bring this type of contention this judgment upon society verse 18 beyom hahu now in my bible i i emphasize that i underscored it because that expression speaks about judgment always be yom hahu oftentimes it speaks about the final judgment day but in this context it's speaking simply about judgment that that judah is going to experience because babylon is coming now before babylon does we find that assyria in a joint confederacy with israel that northern kingdom is going to want to attack israel and will but this will not lead to Israel or Judah's demise. But God is going to, under prophetic leadership of Isaiah, he is going to spare the people because of a king who repents and trusts in God. But this is not going to happen long term. Israel is going to fall into, or more precisely, the southern kingdom, Judah, is going to fall into idolatry like its northern counterpart israel and find itself going into exile in babylon so beyomahu in judgment on that day the lord he will remove the splendor now it's a word that has to do with glory there's a couple different words in hebrew for glory one is kavod one is pa'ar this is that word we may be more familiar with the word teferit. Teferit is splendor, usually translated in this way. So God's going to remove the splendor. What he's saying here is this. There is a call, an anointing upon Judah. And because they are not faithful to that, God is going to remove that. And in this sense, he's going to remove all of these outward emphasis that the women have. He says, I will remove the Lord in judgment day, will remove the splendor. And here's this next word. The next word in the text is the word ha-akasim. This is the same word in a different form for these ankle bracelets. And again, the purpose is to make noise, to jingle. God doesn't like that. It's emphasized here first because God does not want us to call attention to ourselves, 
but rather to call attention to his holiness, his righteousness, his purposes. And this is why we see in Orthodox Judaism, in Haredi Judaism, that uh, people dress, the men dress in a very uh, similar manner, in a simple manner, so that none stands out because foundationally they recognize that we're not about exalting self but exalting God, not calling attention to ourself but calling attention to the Lord God that people might receive his truth. So here in that day of judgment, the Lord will remove the splendor the ankle bracelets, the scarf, and the ornamentation. So all of these things that have to do with with female uh, attire, but for the purpose of exalting self, promoting self, glorifying self, all these things are going to be taken away. Look, if you would, now to verse 19. And the necklace and the bracelets, and the veil. Now, here again, the veil was used. In one sense, we see, and the rabbinical commentators point this out, that a veil can be used for truly modesty, uh, covering up, or it can be used in a different way for seduction. And, and here it's talking about how they have misappropriated and used and even changed how they appeared. Different words are used here, by the way. And this is why the rabbinical authorities say that they have misappropriated, they have, have utilized what should be for one purpose for the exact opposite. So necklaces and bracelets and veils are going to be as well taken away. Verse 20 Also, we see those things that uh, it's the same word for splendor that I talked about in that root form, those things that that glorify, those things that that make something special. So God's going to remove that. He's going to remove the leg decor. Now, here again, this is jewelry that was worn on the leg in order to call attention to that part of the anatomy. And here again, if you do a good study of of the commentators, they will say that it relates to a great degrading of women and making them simply physical objects and nothing more. And when we look at our society today, and I'm speaking about the West, but it's also true in Israel and other places, in Asia and such, we see that same emphasis on the physical and it degrades women because it turns them into simply visible objects for one's usually a man's own pleasure so these things those things that are glorifying these leg ornaments and also the the sashes or the bands now here again this may be a band that is worn on the arm or a leg or on the head or it may be a sash the, the language here, and by the way, in preparing for this, in order to, to look at the Hebrew text, I mean, it took much effort because these words are not normal daily uh, Hebrew words that we find in society today, in a Hebrew-speaking society, or they're not normal words that find themselves being repeated throughout the Tanakh. Very unique language here. And each word requires uh, quite a bit of research and and study, tracking it down, looking at a root which may not be familiar, but that's how we study the word of God. Now look later on in verse, verse 20. We talked about those things that bring splendor or glory, the leg decor, the sashes or the bands, and also the, the boxes of, of uh, fragrance and also various uh, charms. So when we look at this, this chapter, more than any place in the Bible, we see a list of various uh, uh, jewelry and uh, uh, accessories in order to do one thing, and that is to call attention to 
the physical appearance of a woman. And all of this has to do with the women being exalted for fleshly purposes. What we would say in Hebrew, matarot, gashmiot, rather than for spiritual reasons. So a great uh, misappropriation and a wrong, wrong utilizing of, of the things and the purposes of God. Look now to verse 21. Here we talk, ha tabaot. Tabaot are rings in the normal sense of rings, but we also have ve nizme ha'af. It's the ancient Hebrew word, one of them for earrings, but not for an ear, but we have the word ha'af, which is nose. So rings, these can be rings for the fingers, for the toes, or as we see here, additional word that speaks about a nose ring verse 22 now in verse 22 we move away from the ornamentation the jewelry the accessories and we get more to the clothes themselves in verse verse 22 we have that which is festival garments now here's what it's saying they're using garments, and this word usually it appears not many times, but a handful of times, and it speaks about a garment that relates to the redemption, the freedom, the release that God has given us from the, the condemnation of sin, the bondage of sin, the oppression of sin, the, the pain of sin. And now these things, this type of garment, the same word is being used and utilized not for a godly uh, uh, heralding of announcing and praising and thanking him, worshiping him, but for oneself. So the festival garments and also the things that uh, are wrapped around a woman with the various uh, scarfs and also bags. Now, in preparation for this, I was sharing with my wife, and I say this humorously now, but my wife uh, likes handbags. So we go through all of this, and as we're going through the various things, you know, we're reading no response and whatever, and when I say that he's going to also be removing and judging these things of the festival garments and those things that are wrapped around you and these scarfs, no response. And then I said, and also the handbags. And she says, oh. Now, the point is here that we all have. We all have things that we latch onto that we like for a personal reason. We need to identify those things and realize that our whole essence, our very being, every, as Paul says, that we need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah Yeshua. Not utilizing things for self-exaltation, but rather using things to glorify God. So he speaks about these things he's removing. Move to verse 23. Also for mirrors and uh, blankets. This is really the word for sheets in modern uh, Hebrew. Also turbans. These are head attire. And finally robes. Verse 24. In verse 24, we've seen what God has already removed, what he's going to judge. But notice there's another response. And in my opinion, verse 24 is one of the most significant verses in this, this chapter. It tells us a great deal about what happens. See, God, remember this principle of what, what we measure with, our standards, will be measured back to us. And God, when we, we walk in obedience, he blesses us. When we walk in disobedience, and disobedience is always rooted in selfishness, a personal objective rather than a heavenly purpose. And when we do that, there's going to be an outcome. Notice what it says, verse 24. And, and there will be an exchange of bosom. This is a 
pretty, a pleasing fragrance or perfume. Instead of perfume, there will be mak. Now, mak is a word that in, in modern Hebrew, it's one of the words that can relate to gangrene. So I have an infection in my body, and the infection gets worse and worse and worse until it becomes just a rot, an utter piece of flesh that is in the decay. It's dead. And what do we know? A horrible odor. And this is why it says in the exchange of, of perfume, you'll have something that that, that has a putrid smell like something which is rotting. And there will also be, instead of a belt or a slash, there is going to be a rope. Now this also, some of the commentaries point out that this speaks to poverty, that you don't have the normal garment, but you have to use a rope to bind your, your, your garments. And in exchange for well-groomed hair, or hair that has been set, we have baldness. And baldness speaks of shame in this context. And instead of fine uh, uh, garments, and this might be a, an outer garment like a, a coat, instead of a fine coat, there is going to be, to be sackcloth. And then he says, key, and this word key speaks about relating to burning something, but, but most commentators see this as branding. Now, branding speaks about ownership. So notice it says, instead of the, the yofi, the beauty, that which is appropriate, that which is pleasing, yofi, in modern Hebrew, it's, it's beauty, but it comes from a word which means appropriate or fitting. And instead of that, there's going to be branding, that burning. And just think, when something's branded, it produces a scarring. It takes away what the natural intent was, and it puts something different. Verse 25. Now it foreshadows the exile, that there's going to be war coming. For he says, and here again, a unique word, and he's speaking to Judah or perhaps specifically to Jerusalem. And he says, your, your young men will fall with the sword. Your mighty men, and this can, can be the word for heroes, they will fall in war. Verse 26, our last verse. What's the outcome? Now remember, we see a society that's emphasized the outward, putting attention upon the physical body, especially that of, of a woman or women in general. This, this obsession with that aspect. And what is it going to bring soon? It will bring lamenting and mourning at her gates. Her, Jerusalem, a city is feminine in Hebrew. So that's why it says her gates. We would say it gates, but it's referring to Jerusalem. And she will set and this is probably relating to as well sitting like sitting Shiva. She will sit on the land. And then the word is, is a word for me to be cleansed. But the point is to be made empty, cleaned away. Everything's going to be removed. So it has in this context, it's the normal word for cleaning, but it has in this context that which is empty. So it goes to this final point, and that is you are going to have an abundant life. When I say abundant, I mean of God's abundant presence and his abundant provision, not speaking about dollars necessary, but I'm speaking about his provision that you'll have everything you need to serve him and to fulfill in a, a praiseworthy manner what God has called you to do. That's prosperity. But what Jerusalem is going to experience is an emptiness, a, a, a taking away, not receiving, but being stripped bare, being cleansed of all what they have. So what we see here 
is that God's going to move mightily, either mightily to bless, provide, or mightily to bring judgment, his condemnation, and his curse. And notice how what's being emphasized here is the state of women. Women are indeed the spiritual foundation. Well, again, I'm out of time until next week when we'll move on to Isaiah and chapter 4. Shalom from Israel.